So thank you very much. <laughs> Good to have you all here. So I think I'll start with you, Jimmy. From your perspective, you know, you've worked, you trained here, you've worked in the UK, you've come back here. So you have multiple perspectives on what the challenges are in terms of trying to provide better health care in Nigeria. From my perspective, coming back, I spent 25 years in the UK. The, if one takes a global perspective of healthcare in Nigeria, there are a number of problems. Um, and interestingly, they are not dissimilar to what had happened in other places. Uh, we just lag a little bit behind. And like most other things, we also don't have the will to fight some of these issues. I think the number one issue actually relates to, um, I, if I could refer to it as customer service issues, uh, but then one needs to break the customer service issues down to communication. So that communication is a big problem. Um, also, respect for the patient, appreciating that, but for the patient, if you're a doctor, you don't have a job. And so from my perspective, if we can put the patient to the forefront of healthcare in Nigeria, I think we're half of the way there. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. What's your own take on this? My name is Douglas Emeka Oko, consultant neurosurgeon. Um, I completed my training about two years ago. Okay. Now, what are the realities? Keyword, value for human life. What is the value for human life in Nigeria? The value for human life in places like UK, America, Germany, Finland, the value for human life in places like that is a mainstream social political issue. A mainstream social political issue. And when the value for human life in those places is at the top, in those developed economies, it dovetails into everything. So what are the realities in Nigeria? Number one, value for human life down the drain, okay? Number two, the governments at all levels in Nigeria, be it federal, state, local, or whatever it is, okay, healthcare is not a priority. The healthcare system in Nigeria has massively failed Nigerians. I'm on a WhatsApp group with my, with my, my classmates who were in medical school together. And sometimes they, they, they tell stories, oh, this patient who had this kind of particular problem, I went to the patent medical or went to the Babalao or something like that. And I'm like, why are you blaming them? I went to the church. The healthcare system in Nigeria has failed Nigerians. Nigerians do not trust the system anymore. 13, collabo. Collaboration. One of the things I found out with, with the health and tech is that um, the techie guys, they come, they provide some sort of solution, and then they walk away. No. Proper collabo. You're sharing risk. You're sharing everything. You're sharing profits or whatever. You're in it together. Another thing is promotion, advocacy, and marketing. If you do not market it properly to the healthcare leaders, managers, people in the field, and stuff like that, and actually to the wider society to see the clear benefits of it, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work at all. This marriage... Oh, no, sorry, this romance between health and tech can lead to marriage, right? It should lead to marriage. It will lead to marriage for one reason and one reason only, and you can tweet this. The Nigerian patient is worth it. Are there ways that, um, you know, the tech sector can help us do that? You know, we've looked at how in terms of politics uh, in different parts of the world, you know, tech has played a role in harnessing people power. Can we harness Nigerian patient power? I'd like to talk to Orede, who works a lot with communities as well. So it'll be interesting to hear her perspective. All right, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Orede Doati, and um, I, I'll introduce myself. I'm a pediatrician and a public health specialist. Um, as Douglas mentioned, one of the things that we have failed at um, abysmally as healthcare providers is continuing to maintain the trust of the people in what we do, in the services we provide. 70% of the healthcare which comes to the private sector is actually provided by the informal sector. 
people close to the people in their communities, patent medicine vendors, people whom they can trust. You know, if you want to solve a problem, you've got to get close to it. You've got to go to death row where the people are and experience what they're experiencing and hear their stories. And backtrack from that is the reason why communities are important, obviously, is because that's where the greatest number of people are. People go to patent medicine vendors because the primary healthcare system has failed them. And if we had a primary healthcare system that functioned on behalf of the people, we would, without a shadow of a doubt, have covered a good amount of the healthcare that we need to provide because we need to prevent. You cannot do anything for the healthcare system if you do not know what the real numbers are. We still don't know how much malaria we have in Nigeria. We still don't know how much typhoid fever, if we have in Nigeria, how much of it we have. You know, what we do is we just gauge it and then we throw um, commodities at them. Well, now we know whether these people need 6,000, these people need 600. That's technology. Uh, thank you very much for that already. I think Bidem is a, a customer care um, and public relations expert and hopefully, Given some of the things we are talking about, it will be interesting to hear um, her own perspective. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bidemi Zakariao. Um, I'm the founder of LSFPR, which is a public relations consultancy. I think the first thing I would like to address is the market and what the real size of the market is. Everyone starts to emphasize that, oh, we're 100 and 80 million, we're 180 million, but that's not the true size of the market. There's 180 million, but how many people can really use your product or your service or what you're offering? So I think it's very important to always narrow down, is your product only going to realistically reach 10 million? And not just look at it as this 180 million market, because that is not the true market. To be able to capture that true market, you need to educate people. There are people without access to electricity, not to even talk about technology and the internet and so many other things. Um, you may be reaching a mass market audience, you may be reaching a, a niche audience, you may be reaching a, um, middle class people. It depends and you sort of need to know what works for you. Even though PR marketing and branding is all nice and fancy. If you don't have a good product or a good service, I don't think anyone would be buying. Okay, thank you very much, Bidemi, for the, uh, the, 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 that perspective. Um, at this point, I'd like to actually open it up to the audience for question and answer. Do we have a microphone for the audience? So if we're talking about ultimate tech, how do we involve politicians? Because everything still boils down to how the government plays a significant role in implementation of anything we do in our romance here between health and technology. So how do we include them? I have to say I don't really have the answers, but I think it's very important to start get, getting the government involved in these sort of conversations. Yes, government is doing a lot, and you know they do have a budget for health and all of that, but sometimes it's the people that will tell them what the needs are. And I think that if we start to get the government involved in these sort of conversations, then something will begin to happen. Lady before her, they spoke about data, find out real numbers. They, we don't know the actual number of people with malaria in Nigeria till today. And this is the same thing. We don't know the actual number of people with this disease. And how can we begin to solve these problems? In Rivers and Uyo, we basically can have a clinician sit down with a card reader. It's a very simple, it's a card reader. And he slides the test, the same rapid diagnostic test we use everywhere in the country that's approved by the federal government, slides it in, but he's got to follow the steps. And it tells you, please put your blood in now, put, in, put the uh, buffer in now, you put in too much buffer, repeat the test. And it guides you so that you do the test accurately. By the time you've done this for a thousand times, you become an expert, you find that you're having fewer errors. That's one thing. So it was guiding the clinicians. The other thing was that it could automate, automatically send your result, positive, negative, invalid, directly into DHIS, which is a platform that reports, where we report malaria to nationally. What this did, it told us where there was malaria and where there was not, because it increased diagnostic accuracy. Thank you so much to our panelists. I think they've set a very good tone. 
um, lots of things to think about, lots of things to um, discuss and chew over. Thank you.